Aufstehen. Okay, allerseits. Good morning, everybody. Guten Morgen. Die ein ha. Ich fange das ja gerne immer dann auf Deutsch an. Aber <lacht> ähm, ich bin Alexandra Lieben. Ihr kennt mich alle miteinander. Vizepräsident von Astina zusammen mit Dietrich und Chapter President of Pacific South. Our very wonderful chapter in Southern California. And today we have a great pleasure to have one of our fellow Austrians with us, an unusual talk in the sense that he's giving us insight and an introduction into an arena that we normally don't know much about. So I'm very grateful, Thomas, for you to be here and, and to share this with us. To give all of you a background about Thomas, Thomas Mikus, He has been here for many years. In 2011, he co-founded White Bear PR, which is a public relations company that specializes in composers, music supervisors, soundtrack promotions, and international film music festivals. He spearheaded the successful award campaigns for Volker Bertelmann, All Quiet on the Western Front, so just this year, Hildo Gudna Dottir for Joker and Chernobyl, Jermaine Franco, for Encanto, and Carlos Rafael Rivera for Queen's Gambit. Thomas also worked on the PR campaigns for the award, Academy Award nominated Best Score and Best Original Song for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. He works with composers such as Rachel Portman for Julia, Uno Helmerson, Flea, Daniel Hart, The Green Knight, Natalie Holt, Loki, Dan Roma, etc., etc. Wirklich like a lot of people who have done great things. Thomas is also the US publicist for several international festivals and conferences. He creates and curates film music content and panels for festivals such as Cannes, Sundance, Tribeca, and many others. With one word, Thomas knows a thing or two about promoting people, ideas, projects, and stories. It's one thing to do great work and another to let the world know about it. Thank you, Thomas, for being here. Well, thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's funny. I'm, I want to talk about fear of self-promotion, and I'm always getting kind of verklemmt when someone talks about what I'm doing. Um, but uh, so, as you said, you know, I'm working um, in entertainment, specifically for composers in film and television, but I also represent some studios. Uh, but for today's talk, I want to keep it a bit more general and talk more about the philosophy of self-promotion and give some tips. And then hopefully uh, we also have some time at the end to answer questions that, you know, might then be a bit more specific about uh, uh, science writing, etc. Uh, let me just share my... Uh, I have a little PowerPoint that I kind of... Uh, changed, I hope, uh, but I, you know, it mainly helps me to see where we are in the talk. Here we are. Uh, well, first, uh, I mean, you kind of talked about accomplishments, but I, I kind of quickly, I'm going to try to make it quick uh, at my age, it's not that quick, I uh, want to talk about how I got here, I, mainly because I think it's it's interesting because, you know, we all have our different uh, journeys uh, to Los Angeles or to the United States. Um, I was born in Vienna, in Strebersdorf, to be exact, and um, I uh, went to Hauptschule and then Polytechnische Lehrgang, And because I started school at five, I was also done at 14 and started uh, a apprenticeship or Lehre. Uh, my parents wanted me to become a Kellner. They thought it's the ultimate job. <laughs> and after two months, this was not for me. And I dropped off out and happened to, uh, you know, I always like books and I was in a bookstore and I thought, oh, I could be a bookseller. And so I became an apprentice in a bookstore and book and art store in Vienna and finished that. Uh, it was kind of cool because uh, during that time, I also um, discovered my love for language uh, and writing. And uh, when I was 16, uh, the Fischer Verlag, uh, Fischer Publishing House in Frankfurt had the 100 year anniversary. 
and they had a bid writing uh, contest and I was the winner for that writing contest and was invited to Frankfurt for that. And then a year later, I was 50 years after the Anschluss. So I wrote a 40 page uh, essay about the Holocaust and again, won the first prize and was invited to Yad Vashem and to Israel. So I, I, I don't think I would have ever discovered that if I wouldn't have worked in a bookstore. Um, then I made Zivildienst, I, I, you know, instead of going to the Bundesheer, I went to Zivildienst and worked in a youth center, uh, stayed there, uh, and then wanted to see the world. So I had this idea of becoming a flight attendant, uh, didn't think that you need to know foreign languages, so I, you know, I could hardly speak English back then. So I cheated my way in and uh, became a flight attendant somehow with charm, I made it in there. And uh, saw the world for two and a half, three, uh, three years, uh, then resigned, went to India for a few months, and then uh, to the US. I won the green card, moved to Miami, uh, modeled, acted, uh, then became, went into tourism, was general manager for the biggest German tour company, bringing tourists to the United States. Uh, uh, then worked in their office uh, in New York City at the Empire State Building after September 11. Um, then I worked as talent agent. Uh, it was all coincidence. You know, I never, I think that's my, I never planned any. It's just, you know, I, I remember I went to church. I didn't have a job. And someone said, oh, there's a talent agency. They might look for someone. And I just called the same, you know, when I was a waiter, I, I literally went to a bookstore and I thought, oh, that's cool. And called the bookstore I was in at the same day they, I didn't even know they had made a they put an ad in Korea that they're looking for someone and so yeah so I was a talent agent I did that for many years opened the office in Los Angeles booked acts on cruise ships and then in 2009 or 10 I was without a job again and again a, a friend just said hey there is two composers that want to work with me um I cannot do it, but I can teach you how to be a publicist. Would you be interested? And so I didn't know what a publicist does back then. And I also was not like really into, I mean, I, I appreciated music always, but you know, I never thought of working with composers. And that's how I started. And then I, uh, in 2011, I started my own company. And, and the last few years have been quite successful. So that's how I got here. Uh, I, I know other people have like um, a clear plan and that's what I do and that's and for me it's always been uh, what does life bring me and uh, what could be the next thing and I kind of think there will be one or two more careers in my life after publicity that's kind of my hunch um uh I, I, I don't know how familiar you guys are with what a publicist does uh, and why you would hire a publicist. Uh, so here it's just a general overview. Uh, I mean, a, a publicist can work with an individual, can also work with an organization or with a company. We do all of that, but all in the music uh, world. So it's basically to garner attention for the individual, the organization or the company to promote uh, that individual. It's mostly how we work based on, and I think it's usually always based on, on a project. You know, you have to think about it. So we work with media and media, you know, if media writes about you, sometimes, you know, with an organization, they or you know, they might write about the career in general, but it's always more difficult than having having a current project and it could be a book release, it could be a film release, it could be, uh, you know, in whatever field you work, but, you know, it's something current where that the readers then could benefit from. It could be a new exhibit and then they write about, you know, you know, and then the audience can go and watch the exhibit. So there's, there's, there, there needs to be a, a hook, but also I feel a, a project uh, to promote sometimes it's troubleshooting and making sure if there is some negative stories out there to turn them into positive uh, uh, storytelling and what's the last one yeah basically m managing the public image of of an individual or company uh, 
so this is all you know so we make sure that the branding is cohesive that uh, it also goes into i think I have that yeah uh, web content uh, speeches photos for the individual uh, so um yeah we just want to make sure it's the whole package and we do that through uh, story pitching to media uh, we create panels, um, you know, I think uh, panels and, and um, speeches are a great way to get out there in the world and put your name out there uh, through networking, networking opportunities. Um, uh, we do media training and I think media training, uh, speech training is very important. So if you, if you want to do PR, uh, I think, um, you know, I would definitely look into that. Uh, we work on social media and make sure all the promotional materials are together. And that could be, uh, you know, the photos, the website, uh, social media, um, one pages about your work, uh, you know, whatever, in whatever field you work, you know, to make sure you have that all together. Um, so when we work with uh, composers, and it's not only composers, it's artists, it, it's in general, you know, it's like, and I talked about myself, you know, there's this kind of, I don't know if it's fear of self-promotion of it, and it's it, it's interesting, I, I see that really more with European clients than with American clients, it's this um, fear of being seen as a rampen self. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to make it about ourselves. We don't want to put ourselves in the foreground. And, you know, I had that even, you know, I had, <laughs> I had this uh, British composer who came to New York and flew me to New York for his, it was a big film, the premiere red carpet. And literally before the red carpet, he is like, I'm not walking there because I don't want to take away from the film. I don't want to take away from the director. Uh, it was a woman director back then, and um, and uh, I convinced him to walk the carpet, and uh, mainly because, you know, in that instance, uh, no one else on that carpet can talk about music. The producer cannot talk really about the, you know, how he created the music. The director can, the actors can, only he can, and it's not about him. It's about the project how he adds to the project it's always never about just the individual it's always about the larger thing and in that instance it's about the film um and uh, interestingly enough at the end of the red carpet we talked to the director uh and she had the exact same fear she didn't want to walk the carpet because she was afraid of taking away from the actors and uh and i think uh you always have to understand it's not about you generally it's about it's about something bigger i feel it's about uh you know it could be about the book you've written it's about the invention it's about science it's about here it's about the film you are always part of something and i think the moment you step away and not make it about yourself but make it about what you've done what you've created what you're doing about the project hopefully that takes away the pressure and then you can always talk differently about it because you are talking about something and not about yourself so i hope that kind of that makes sense a bit um so when you do PR or self-promotion a lot you can you can do yourself um when we work with clients and i think that you can also ask yourself uh, you ask yourself why would you like to promote yourself uh yeah is it uh, because you have a new project where do you want to go with it uh do you want to create do you want to have a new audience do you want to uh, find a new job or job opportunities so I, I think you need to be clear also why are you doing pr because it helps you know should you work with a publicist it helps them also to see if how they go about it but also i think it's important for you why 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 you want to promote your work and you know what would you like to accomplish kind of goes with it where do you see yourself i'm you know i'm a big uh, fan of uh, goal setting and where you want to go in your future um 
and uh, and then you know that kind of also informs which outlets do you see writing about your work uh you know because uh, i think it has to do with the goals and uh why you're doing pr i mean in our world if it's different if a composer wants to uh, have a bigger fan base versus wanting uh, to win an award or getting more work you know it's like it depends on then what out and it's sometimes it's several goals but that depends on um, how we go about the uh, the the campaign uh, in my experience um the most important thing when doing PR for me is uh, to really come up with a, a great and unique story. Uh, like, again, you know, I'm talking about composers, but I think you can translate that to many fields. It's not just enough to say, hey, he is a composer and he or she wrote the music for this film. We really have to, and we usually have a good 45, 60 minute conversation with the composer and, and look at every angle and, and ask tons of questions and, and come up with a very specific story that then we can tell the press. Um, you know, uh, it's not, you know, we look at what you know what obstacles did the composers have to over overcome what was the conversation with the director what uh, what did the composer learn was there and it could be it could be an emotional impact it could be a craft in impact you know it, it, we look at every angle and i mean i think and i think it's the same in you know in architecture and writing and anything you do how how you i we always look at how can audience benefit from the story? How can someone learn from that story? And how did they create uh, the music? How, what was the approach like? Uh, did they create new instruments, new sounds? Did they, you know, like, you know, that, I mean, you know, with Hilda Gunnadop, it was, you know, in Chernobyl, she went to a power plant in, in like this full suit and recorded sounds there. There's always, and sometimes, you know, there's not that big thing that you just sit there, but then it, you might have learned something about, you know, um, the project you've worked on, but you always have to ask yourself, what's, what's really unique about it? What, what, what's inspiring about it? What's educational about it? And how can someone benefit from it? I think that's, for me, that's the most important thing. And that's how I like to work. Because again, then it's not about uh, necessarily you, but it's how can someone benefit from your experience from what how you have created that piece or how you have um, worked on what you've been doing. Um, and the same, <clears throat> I use the same approach for for social media. Um, and I think the social media, when when talking to people, is the most kind of this is love hate relationship, I suppose. Uh, you know, when people don't want to be too, you know, how should I post and what should I post, and uh, I don't want to be, I don't want to make it too much about me. And I think it's the same. So when I look at social media, I feel it's maybe 50 50. It's or maybe even less, 40% posting about an art, you know, you as an artist or, an, or a scientist or whatever you do. And the other 60% is connecting with other people. And I think it's often overlooked uh, the, uh, the importance of that. Uh, you know, like I see a lot of artists that then only post about, oh, I've done that, I've done this, I've done, look how great I am. And that I feel could be a bit repelling maybe um and again first of all it's it's about the messaging if you make it about the work if you think about what post is worthy of posting what goes with my general managing messaging sorry uh and uh how can someone benefit from my post you know i always ask how can someone benefit from this is it just words or can someone actually learn something from that 
And then the other 60% is about using social media platforms to connect with other people. You know, there's so many groups out there on, on Facebook on, uh, that you might be able to join. You know, in my world, you know, like going to a film festival, I, I, I look at all the Sundance Film Festival, Cannes Festival, Film Festival groups. I look at composer groups. I look at, uh, you know, I mean, even, you know, we have our friends in LA, Germans in LA, all those groups and feel like, how could I connect there and how can I, and I think the important thing that I always tell my clients about social media is also if you uh, want to use social media to be um, as a promotional tool, you kind of need to first create your circle and you can do that by, you know, reacting to other people, other people's posts by lifting other people up so to say also you know like um, as an example in my world uh, you know like i always tell composers to also uh, lift other composers up when you see that someone has been doing great work then let them know publicly in social media or even if you write them a, a, a private message if you see a film, then, you know, write the director, post that you liked something and be specific why you liked it, why it made an impact on your life. And by doing so, uh, you know, you build your circle also. Um, and then when you have something to promote, I, I feel people will see you in a different light also and, and will also um, support you. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my my um, thing on social. I, and I think it takes away also this constantly, you know, posting about yourself and look at me, look at me, look at me, because you you also put the spotlight on other people and you put the, the spotlight on your work again. Uh, so, you know, some questions that you might want to ask yourself, what is my objective? How can people benefit from uh, my post? What is the news here? Well, what do I want to say? Because I think it's not always clear. Um, and uh, ooh, what is my audience that I'm using for social media? I think, oh my God, that was it. Um, yeah, so that is kind of, a, 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 I just wonder because I know we don't have much time, so I didn't go into much detail. Uh, but I wanted to um, give a quick overview of kind of, you know, my philosophy about PR, and that is mainly to make it about a project, to make it about something bigger than the individual and always have a project that you can write about and to use social media as a tool to, to really build your community, to, to lift other people up, to, to write about others. And I'm not talking, you know, I mean, obviously I have my personal and, you know, that is about travel and food and tons of photos about me, but I'm talking about you as a public figure and, uh, and you know, a speaker or whatever you do. Um, one thing I also want to talk, because that I often get asked about writing a biography um, or uh, how do you write a good biography? Um, and just a few pointers. I think there is the, uh, and the, uh, I think a lot of biographies are way too long. Um, I mean, you might want to have a, a long bio for, you know, it's uh, academical, but I think for you, you need something catchy and short also. Um, and there is a difference between a CD and a bio. And I think it's also more American than what we do in, in Europe. Where it's more, the look, a bio is often more like a CD. But here it's really a promotional tool. A, a bio can have a more, I don't know, flowery uh, language, uh, you know, it can talk you up a bit more where, you know, a CD is more factual. Um, and I always think about the attention span of people and people often read the first paragraph, but then the second, third, fourth, fifth, maybe not so much. So if the first paragraph doesn't really go I have like all the highlights about what you're doing uh you might lose the reader and so 
I think the first paragraph needs to really be very specific. Um, and again, bringing it back to composers, a lot of composer uh, biographies I read say um, he or she is a composer for film and television, uh, got into composing because of the love for music, and went to this school and learned the piano at a young age and loved John Williams. And uh, it's just very generic and it doesn't say anything about who that person is. So I like, you know, I like to start with what, you know, you know, she is um, an uh, avant-garde composer, uh, you know, known for her minimalistic style of sounds, you know, like, like really about the music and then, you know, the first paragraph could be some big, you know, you know, uh, you know, not known for his work on the library in Alexandria or his award winning architectural style and like really very specific and about who you are as an artist, who you are as a painter, what kind, what's your technique, what's what's the work you're known for. It really needs the highlights. Um, and I think in your world, it might be different for composers. I always tell them to put the education at the end because it uh, it is not as important. Uh, it's their what they have accomplished uh, is more is more important. So I in the second paragraph, I would write about the major accomplishments and then maybe in the third paragraph about about education and that might be might be different um one thing about biographies that i like to put in there and i think that's also general at the end i really want to put something personal in there to kind of give the feel of this is not just a composer this is not just a scientist this is also a human being uh and it could be uh you know, he enjoys nature walk, uh, nature walks with his dogs, or he lives in Los Angeles with his two dogs and enjoys meditation. He is a competitive poker player, whatever you want to put in there, but just one or two sentences to bring it back and make, make you someone approachable. Because I think no matter what we do, you know, it's all about being approachable, being a human being and not just someone up there on a pedestal, this is the composer, this is the writer, this is the curator, this is the architect. No, this is a person that I can relate to. And, and that is what you want to put in a bio. And you know how I write a bio, I start with a factual bio, you know, all the everything that you want to put in there. And then I go over paragraph by paragraph, and then I have a piece of paper. And um, um, I like to write, and then I like to fill it in with, um, uh, um, you know, like, um, he worked on, uh, on, uh, he worked on, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, he worked. He, and then I would write, oh, he wrote this score for All Quiet on the Western Front, and then I would think he wrote the highly acclaimed or the innovative. You know, I would look for Eigenschaftswörter all over. I would like tons of, you know, adjectives, and then I would fill that in because I think that draws, it draws someone in. And I think that's, that then makes the difference between a CV and a bio where you kind of, explain a bit more and talk it up a bit more so that was um i feel like now i was all over the place <laughs> so uh you know and, and so a few things for you i mean you know obviously it's press work it's uh it's you know like how can you promote yourself you know i mean it's your website it's your biography it's social media but uh, you know then it's also about uh you know can you talk on panels? Can you go to networking events? Um, can you, you know, like, 
maybe write guest articles in 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 you know in scientific journals or or you know for organizations um a few things about networking and i think it's the same as um as um um everything else you know the less you make it about yourself the easier it is the less stressful it is because I you know I, I mean I hate you know going to networking I just went to a networking yesterday <laughs> I hated it I, I got there after five minutes I'm like I'm not staying here and then and, and I'm like I'm probably better than everyone else there but uh I hated it um but then I'm like well like uh let's have a goal let's meet two people let's have two good conversations I don't have to meet 20 people um I don't need to well this was about dating but you know I'm like I told myself you, know, you don't need to find a date and if I go to work I'm like I don't need to find a job I don't need to find a publisher I don't need to find a producer for the I just want two great conversations and I really want to get to know two people. I want to really have an exchange there. Um, and uh, I usually have some icebreakers and you know, like, oh, what brings you here? Um, how did you hear about this organization? Uh, you know, at a festival, how do you, how do you enjoy Sundance? Have you seen any films? You know, like some general questions, just icebreakers. I mean, mostly when I'm at the, when I see a plate, I'm like, oh, did you enjoy the food? Uh, what are you drinking? Like just some some sentences. I I like to go to a networking event with a friend because you can introduce each other, which makes it easier. You just have to be careful that you don't stand with your friend all the time. Um, and that's something that I noticed with Europeans for some reason. Um, you know, when I go to networking events with German friends, we have this tendency then to be clickish. And then you go to a networking event and then you stay with your three friends that you came with and don't expand outside. And I'm like, well, that's not very, you know, so I think you have to make sure that really have the goal to meet someone else. And, and that is the, not so much, again, how can I talk about myself, but how can I get to know someone? What it's, it's being curious. How can I learn about someone else how can i learn about this guy who, uh, who 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 is an amazing painter and about his techniques how he started how he you know like really be curious and and the, and i think that is the easiest uh, way of networking and another thing about networking how to choose events um what I see in my community for example in, in composers composers go to composer events all the time and I think it's important to be with your peers, but you kind of need to break always, you always have to challenge yourself and break out and feel like what networking events could I do that maybe not on the first look are as, you know, like, you know, like composers always say, you know, go to directors, go to editors, go to, uh, producer go to other events that are not composers get out of your comfort zone because composers yeah you know i mean it's you know if we all have the same political affiliation and talk about it then we talk preach to the choir you need to step out of it and expand your circle also if that makes sense so that's kind of my networking tips and i think you have to ask me questions otherwise i <laughs> we can uh, if you want, if you if you're done with your with your remarks now, we can open it up and everybody who has a question, come on in. Um, well, Christina has a question. Uh, I, like in my work, I always try to lift up youth voice in STEM. What's STEM? Great question. Science, technology, engineering, and math, or okay. science science in a broader sense. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to take the pressure out of telling stories with and about youth. I have to be understand this uh, through the roof. So you mean not talking to youth, but talking about youth for... Yes, and also helping them to tell their stories. 
helping and, them to tell their stories. Yeah, like really, I, I work a lot with youth, and they actually do. They don't have a lot of voice in in science generally, and I usually try to uplift them because they're the next generation. But mm -hmm. one of the challenges they want to do it, but they they have very high standards because you know they all grew up with social media and and also like very are very careful about like you know we're living in cancel culture and what if I say something wrong so I'm trying but I think like you might actually have to bring something to the table about this yeah yeah I mean I think you know it's interesting you know working with in, in this youth you know there's this you know this fear so I, I think it's two levels you know I think it's on one hand uh you know maybe through uh, training and uh, um I remember I, I I did these workshops for many years. I I I, I was I was doing I, when I lived in San Francisco. I did this uh, dance classes, and I became a teacher in it. And it was all about that uh, there is no wrong or right in movement. It's just movement that comes out of your body, and it's all beautiful. And then I would teach in schools, and uh, one of the exercises we did then we had this catwalk. And you know, it was at the end of a one and a half hour class, and I had half the class on the left and right, and we did this catwalk. And then everyone, every you know, gender, you know, guys, girls, thick, thin, people that could move, that couldn't move, or they thought they couldn't move, just danced through the catwalk. And the the goal of the audience was to really cheer them up and and say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was people had a really good time. It was empowering. And I think that, you know, I would I it really first you need to empower them to the yeah, there is no and because we are so stuck up with doing something wrong and how, you know, if can I say something or what is my presentation sucks. And and I think on one hand I, I would you know, if you have the chance to do exercises with them to really empower them to speak and to to make mistakes and allow them to be total making a fool out of them somehow and still everyone appreciating them. So that's that's one thing. Um, uh, but the other thing is uh, to to you know the telling the story to make it and and that's on one hand difficult because then they have to be even more vulnerable, but to really make it about their unique their personal story, how they feel about what have they learned, what have they discovered, what is, how has, how has, has, uh, what's the impact on their personal life? And I think, you know, the, the best way is to, to, to be as personal as possible with the story, not to try to be too, I, I don't know, academic about it or to, to, to uh, to to be someone else, maybe I should say, you know, to to because we see we see TED talks on video, we see people giving speeches on television, we see those hosts that have their teleprompter. You know, we I mean it's the same. We always and that's the thing with social media. What we see on TikTok is a totally edited down version of like twenty rehearsals, probably. And to 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 tell them no, it's it's about the story, it's about what they say, and it's about sharing who they are, and that will make the best impact because then people emotionally can can connect with them. It's all about connection at the end. Does that does that make sense? Does, is there something that you no, no, I, no, very helpful. Um, I think definitely a lot of food for thought. I, I think I'm getting there, but um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's you know, I mean, I, I think especially with youth, it takes it takes a lot because mm -hmm. for some it comes natural, and they're just standing out and talking. And for some, and, and and especially for them, for the ones it doesn't come natural, or the ones that have to overcome, you know, it could be just a short thing. But you know, it's like if they can make progress, you know, sharing little things about themselves, and and maybe say it would be good to even come up with you know some because you have them in a in a group where you so what i like to do is i also like to um, have this mock-up interviews that i've been doing with groups where you know you have the person that will give the speech in the center on a chair and then you do like a circle around them not so much audience and and 
present, uh, but kind of bring them in a circle. So they're part of the group. And then everyone can ask it like a hot steed and people can ask questions and it becomes more of a conversation. And then, you know, by answering, you know, that becomes the presentation and, and it's not so much, oh, I need to present something. I'm just having a conversation. Um, another exercise that I do when I, you know, I teach at universities on self-promotion and I, I would, um, and I've done it with kids also, with youth, where I pair them up. And um, so it's, let's say, 10 people, and then I make five groups of two and and have them introduce and have them talk about their goals, who they are as, as, a, as a composer in that instance. And then... Uh, and then have the other person present to the group. So like you would tell me what you do, and then I would present you to the group. Um, and that also, I feel, A, takes the pressure off, but also shows what do we see and what land, you know, because it's two different things. And 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 through that, you, you know, I feel people learn uh, what, what lands is like, what is actually what people are interested in? What is the what is the what what makes an impact? Yeah. So, should we move on to the next question? I don't want to lose out like sense sorry. of time. Um, but it's also because you know things like is giving them the permission to speak about themselves because we are so it's That's always imposter right syndrome. It's like I'm should like all these big scientists out there. It's like who am I? Like, no, no. And the same thing is like, we don't have to be perfect. It's okay. It's that pressure. Who has the next question? Because Thomas, this is super helpful. Thank you. Next question, everybody. I don't oh, have I'm a question, but may I have a comment? <laughs> uh, I just really like your idea of being generous and understanding yourself not as a lone fighter, but as part of a community and being generous and giving, um, offering nice words towards your colleagues, your peers also helps, eventually helps you and everybody together. I think that's that's a really empowering um, concept you presented. So I just wanted to thank you for that. That it's just not just me, 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 but it's it's a it's a bigger question than that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's two things to it. I was just thinking when you said that one thing that we shall not overlook that, and I think that's something I have to learn. And um, you know, I think it's it's very important to to lift other people up to, you know, give words of encouragement, to give permission to talk, to be interested, to be curious. But one thing we shall not forget there is also to give ourselves permission to talk, to to encourage ourselves. And that, I, and that maybe is also, for me, it's kind of the upbringing also. And I think maybe it's also something cultural, you know, so we don't feel like imposters, but to, to really look and factually say, no, I'm, I'm, I know what I do and I'm good at what I do. I might not be the best because what is the best? We're all different, but I have something to say. I have, I have my story and by telling my story, there's something that someone can learn. So it, I think what I also want to say that it's, it's, it's important to also encourage yourself and to uplift yourself. It's not always then to lift everyone else up but to 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 sometimes take the time and and step back and 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 look at the art you created uh you know look at the the words you've written and it might not be the most perfect but you've done something and you know to give yourself encouragement all the time i think that's as important and that we often forget and by doing so i think it then will make it easier to 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 share that to the world and and for me, really, when when we tell stories, or or when I talk at universities, or when I listen, I think the the most interesting for me is always the most personal, the most how did someone how did someone go about? It's not the fact that they have written the book; it's about how did they go about it? Why did they write? exactly that story how did it come to them what is the personal hook 
how did it transform their life? You know, it's like, yes, you build that, you know, you, you designed that building, but why, why did you come about it? Why, why, why is, why is this important to you? And, uh, um, you know, I, I think those are always the most impactful stories. And, um, I don't know why we have imposter syndrome because I mean, at the end, there's always someone that is, I think, um, and there's two things. I mean, there's always some, you know, because we always want to be perfect and the best. And I think that's, if we let go of that and just say, no, I've done something and I talk about that. It's not the best. It's not, it's not even the, the only one that does that, but I know what I do and I talk about it no matter on what level I am. And, um, and that's actually the, what you said about networking events, they are really useful because they help us sharpen our message too and practice it over and over again as we talk about ourselves. It's like articulating, right, who we are, but also tailoring it to, to the context. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's one of the first things also when working with a composer. Uh, and I think that's, the, uh, you know, we, you know, what I said earlier, I have this conversation and we, we draft a, a story that we want to tell, you know, especially when it comes to Oscars and Emmys, you know, there's a specific story that we want to tell and we want to have out there about, uh, let's say about, you know, Hilda Gudnadotti, it was she wrote the, the music before, um, before they filmed and the director Todd Phillips played the music on set, Joaquin Phoenix listened to the music and created his performance. So that was the story. It was very unique back then. It was very, you know, the, and now it's happening more and more. But then when when we do when she did interviews or when she does net, you know, like she kind of always came back to that story, you know, that because people then must might ask you in an interview something completely different that is kind of irrelevant or that we actually don't want there. And you see that in politics, you always then spin it back to your story. And I think that's also in networking. Once you know why you're networking, what the stories you want to tell you have something to go back to and you can always turn it around like mm -hmm. I got pretty good and you know when someone asks me questions to always bring it back to what I want to say and because people forget what they even asked once you start talking <laughs> we have other comments other questions yeah you have experience with uh YouTube yeah, I mean, yes, uh, an experience as far as uh, how to promote on YouTube or... We have to put channels together for, I mean, help people put channels together for themselves. Is that, yeah, I mean, Is that a useful tool? Let, let me ask that first. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, we use a social, you know, I mean, for me, it's a, it's a social media tool. Uh, I mean, we use, we don't use Twitter at the moment, uh, just, um, you know, because of the owner, but I use Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, um, a social media tool that is often overlooked. And I would also say the social media tool for sure is LinkedIn, you know, especially in the business world and connecting, you know, I, I would use that. Um, and so, yeah, YouTube, um, I work for a few organizations where we have a YouTube channel and, you know, different playlists. Um, and, and then also, you know, and then you can use YouTube to promote on other social media platforms, but you can also promote within YouTube, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the descriptions, you can then link to other YouTube mm -hmm. uh, channels and to other videos. And it's the same thing, you know, also on YouTube, uh, you know, it's uh, with our company or with the organization we work for, it's not only what we post, but we also then comment and like on our pages. And mm -hmm. that's how we, you know, we've built audience there. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as you know, overall, the trend at the moment is on videos. And I see that during award season this year, um, we, um, and I think it's this whole Instagram, TikTok thing, uh, we used to have panels and instructional videos, like 45, 60 minutes, and uh, which in the beginning of the pandemic got so much share and views. And at the moment, we are down to two and a half minute videos, and that gets the most engagement. 
<laughs> it's like you really have to boil it down. Um, so, so when doing and we have experimented among this uh, women's organization and for their content, what we experiment, experienced in the last year and where we get more views or engagement is, even if we have long videos, let's say a 40 minute video, we still chop it up in chapters mm -hmm. that we then post mm -hmm. and then we post five, six minutes, you know, we have a long one, but we also chop it up in different five, six and have like, oh, this is the chapter about early years, uh, Alexandria, Los Angeles, you know, you we chop it up and then have different descriptions and then people can choose what they watch. It's, I think it's also psychologically, if people see 40 minutes, they might not watch as much as a four or five minute video and then watch another four or five minute and then another four or five minute mm -hmm. video. And at the end, they've watched everything, but it's just, so yeah. But, but Thomas, if you say you have to grab their attention, right, every time they engage with your materials, then if you chop it up, you don't have to. Do you end it with a cliffhanger, the previous chapters? <laughs> like, I mean, how do you how do you keep them coming back for the next chapters? No, we don't do cliffhanger. I mean, hopefully this is as uh, is, uh, you know, I mean, you could, and I don't, you know, you could, you know, if you want to learn more, you know, but no, we just chop it up and then you know if if it's engaging if i have a good time then i look at the next and if the next description is also important is also interesting you know so you know you know i learned how to make apple strudel and then it shows me how to make schnitzel and i'm like oh yeah well that's interesting too so let's watch the schnitzel video i mean it's just <laughs> that's a good example but you know it's like if i'm if this is an engaging conversation and i fall into those five minutes hopefully i'll watch the next five minutes also other questions, other comments? Maybe a comment from me. Um, thanks, Thomas, for the presentation. There are a few things that totally resonated with me. With me. The first one is um, you said you need to have a goal for networking when you're setting out on your networking journey. Don't just go there and see what happens. Oftentimes, yes, life may happen to us, but it's very important to have a goal. Um, that is something that I have drilled uh, down to a one day workshop and also an e-learning course. So I totally love that somebody else uh, is focusing on that as well. Um, the second one is uh, for imposter syndrome. What I typically tell people when we're talking about social media is never to compare yourself to others, only to compare yourself to where you were either when you started out or where you were yesterday. Um, I know that's really hard because you mentioned earlier that uh, we see the redacted version of videos and photos that have been photoshopped and put a filter on. Um, it's really hard for people, uh, especially for young scientists. And I had a conversation with, 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 with a young scientist today who works at an Austrian research institution. And she said to me that she was totally deflated because um, none of her experiments actually pan out and she keeps failing, failing, failing. And I said, well, the goal is not to be successful with the experiment. The goal is to get a step forward every single day. So that's kind of um, maybe an approach that I try to share with people ab about imposter syndrome to try and be a bit better than you were yesterday and not compare yourself to others. Um, and there is <laughs> uh, one more thing about uh, the failures and challenges that you were talking about uh, to show authenticity. And that is maybe a question that I have because oftentimes I hear, yes, also share your failures. Um, but I personally believe not to share the failures when we're in them, but maybe at a later point so we can also include lessons that we've learned or how we got out of them. So question for you, Thomas, would be how do you, how do you tell people to communicate failures to the outside world or things that don't pan out the way that they want to? Um, thank you. Oh God, that's a, thanks for challenging me. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, um, first of all, social media is totally could can be totally brutal, and you know sometimes it might be good then actually to take a step away for a moment. Um, 
but uh, when it comes to failures, um, um, first of all, maybe it's good to to rephrase failures and not even call them failures, uh, because it, it has a very negative thing. And if if you then define it as such, and then oh, I don't want to, I don't want to share it because failure is bad. But if you see it, oh, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a speed bump. It's something that like if you in your mind would say failure is good i celebrate my failures because the failures move me forward without the failures i cannot be successful if you see failure as a as success it would be different but if you if we see failure as i'm bad it's negative it's not good then we might have to find a different word called failure and 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 you know, identify it differently. That, you know, but um, so for sharing, um, I mean, I think there's two options. I mean, you could you could not share it, and and then until you're successful, and then share it and give the story how you overcome it, how you were overcoming it, and how you are good at it. But then, me personally, I think for me it wouldn't be authentic. Because then I again share, now I share it because I am successful. So again, it puts something failure is actually not good. But, you know, I, I share my challenges also when I'm having the challenges because then it gives people, it gives life the opportunity to send me, if I don't find the solution, find someone outside who can maybe give me good advice. So by saying, you know, uh i uh i I'm, I'm learning so you know like a failure is a learning experience if you rephrase it as learning experience i having this learning experience and i'm having trouble i'm i'm trying different things then already someone else can learn from it someone else can kind of connect with you because oh i'm going through that too are oh, you having dating troubles i'm having dating troubles and that's what i'm doing do you want to go out together and go do a networking together and help each other? Because, you know, we can buddy up and we can help each other. Or, you know, I've had, or someone can say, listen, I mean, I know you are going through your experience, but I had something similar and this is what I learned. Maybe you want to try that out and see if that works for you. So if you don't share, you also, you, you, you deprive yourself of that experience. And that's why I, I would share, you know, I'm, I'm someone that, and the fear is that we are being seen as unsuccessful, as weak, as not comp uh, competent, but, um, but I think you have to overcome that if you want to connect and, and, and have that learning experience. Awesome. So I, it doesn't make you it doesn't make you less of a science if you I think it makes you more because you know especially in science we you have to try and try and try you have to you know every book is rewritten five hundred times and then it goes to the editor he makes even more changes every film I mean it's it's not the final product it's always about the final again when i was an actor i was never interesting in performing it was always the rehearsal i was interested in because that was the learning experience that was the discovery and i think it's the same in science yes it's great then if you have a durchbruch if you have but it's it's the going there that's the hopefully the interesting thing it's the trying out it's finding out this doesn't work what else can work and if you share that that's the interesting thing for me personally also i think it empowers yeah. everybody else to talk about it right it's yeah. a human experience that we don't achieve what we set out to do it in the first trial most of the times so i think that makes a whole lot of sense you want to think it also it. makes you a human being yeah exactly. <laughs> i think to show you vulner vulnerability i think that's is what connects other people to you sometimes and it goes back to what Thomas said earlier, you gotta be authentic because you mentioned LinkedIn as well. Uh, there've been those CEOs who had, you know, uh, the tough challenge to let people go and they posted videos of themselves crying when they let people go and showing how hard it was on them. That came across a little inauthentic because they, they, it didn't fit the situation at that moment. So 
Yeah. It's it's also like this this fine line that you need to walk when you're especially on social media or out there public. Um about yeah, and I think you know you always you always have to again you have to take into consideration other people and then you know think is this respectful? Is it disrespectful to other people? How how does what I post also make other people feel? And I'm not saying that again you should uh, you should hold back because you know you cannot always make it about the outside world. You again you have to. This is the line about being authentic is a fine line of. But you know, like, like this story to me seems, you know, a, a bit of a, you know, oh, I'm crying because, you know, I didn't want to let you go. Well, you let them go, you know. Uh, so uh, then crying, but someone lost their job and their livelihood, you know, you know, yeah, Mr. CEO, then give up your paycheck. Uh, you know, uh, you have to be careful there. That's what I'm saying. All right, my dears, we're out of time. Thomas, this was really great. Thank you. I think everybody took something away here. No, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Thomas. And it was really fun. It was great. Thank uh, you, Thomas. Anyway. Happy weekend. Happy Memorial Day weekend. It's barbecue. Yes. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.